1980, Moldvay's basic set was a huge success, and they wanted to expand on it. In a way, this was less an idea that TSR was having, and more a concession to reality. For many young people, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons was simply too complicated and too poorly organized to play. They bought basic and stuck with it, expanding its rules on their own. TSR tapped David Zeb Cook. Dave was the third full-time designer hired at TSR. Previously, he'd been a teacher, and the nickname Zeb was a gift from his students. Once he'd started work at TSR, Dave was the kind of writer you could just rely on. Writing adventure modules for original Dungeons & Dragons, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, and Basic Dungeons & Dragons, it was natural to give him the role of expanding out Basic. The basic books only took characters up to 3rd level. Now, an expert, you could advance all the way to level 12. There are many who view the Moldvay cook basic expert combo as the ideal form of D&D. These fans call the set BX. Cook started out as a teacher, and his basic rules literally helped teach the game for generations of ravenous young fans. Later, in a supplement unfortunately titled Oriental Adventures, Zeb Cook would help to create the non-weapon ability system which we would recognize as the game's first set of defined skills. Skills became a key feature of the game in later editions. Thus, he permanently and irrevocably etched his name into the legacy of this hobby forever. Yeah, because that doesn't really... The skills don't really exist outside of, like, thieves open locks, listen next to door. Exactly, yeah. yeah. A standardized set of skills that all characters have access to doesn't exist before his Oriental Adventures uh, non-weapon abilities. Glad to have that to look forward to, then. Uh -huh. He also accidentally saved the bard from the chopping block in 2nd edition, but we all make mistakes. No! <laughs> that's a good thing! My favorite class! <laughs> in 1983, the D&D cartoon was a roaring success. Millions of young children were curious about learning the game. TSR wanted to appeal to new fans and fans of D&D Basic alike with a product line that catered exclusively to them. Beck me. Beck Me was short for Basic Expert Companion Master Immortal. Oh, it's a tier list! Uh-huh. A series of books released by TSR that took players from levels 1 to 3 in Basic, all the way into the levels beyond 30 in Immortal. From fighting goblins to fighting gods, a full D&D experience without ever needing to touch the advanced rules. For this task, they tapped Frank Mincer. As the person in the company most responsible for teaching the game via the RPGA, and as a prolific editor, the task of revising the basic rules again seemed perfectly suited to Mincer's talents, and in fact it was. He wisely changed very little of the rules from Moldvay's version, only altering the presentation and layout into a format that was more like a tutorial. The other big change was to tap Larry Elmore for the cover. What can be said about Larry Elmore that hasn't already been said by smarter and more talented writers than me? He's one of the greatest fantasy artists of all time. A lot of the early D&D art has a somewhat amateurish charm that made it feel both approachable and yet still fantastical and grand. Larry Elmore was the end of all that. At the time Larry Elmore's first work hit the page of a D&D product, the bar had been permanently and irrevocably raised. From now on, fans and creatives alike were going to hold D&D to a higher standard. Sometimes that would actively work against the D&D line. After all, there's not many artists as amazing as Larry Elmore, and even fewer that TSR can afford. The most disgusting thing about Larry Elmore is how natural his talent is. He was raised in Kentucky, a place his family had been since before it was even a state. His school had no art class, and he had no formal training. He was entirely self-taught until he got to college. In an interview later in his life, he remembers that when he first went to art class in college, he was asked who his favorite artist was. He said that it was Norman Rockwell and Frank Frazetta. His teacher sneered and asked if he wanted to be a cheap commercial artist. He thought about it for a while and said, well, yeah, it seems like those guys are getting paid. Norman Rockwell and Frank Frazetta's work now sell for millions and Larry Elmore absolutely stands with them as an American art legend. In his last year of school, he was drafted, but thanks to his art skills, he mostly served in the capacity of doing art for the military at Fort Knox. Once the Vietnam War ended and he was released from service, he was able to get a job at a printing company until he was able to get hired at TSR as a full-time artist. He believed this time working in printing made him a better artist by better understanding the strengths and limitations of commercial printers. His art's also throughout the book, too. Oh, I yeah. Because yeah, when you said the last name, I was I recognized that from one of the signatures throughout the book. So I guess 
-hmm. most of the art in the book, I assume, because it's all within that kind of same style. He's a prolific uh, contributor to D&D at this time. During 1983, TSR reported its first ever loss. Greenfield Needlewomen was not living up to its promised returns, and the company was forced to ride it off. Suddenly finding themselves in a liquidity crunch, TSR was forced to go to the banks and negotiate a loan. This task fell to Kevin Bloom. Kevin Bloom later said, I was the best there was in the company, but I wasn't the right person. Which is probably not what you want your CEO to be saying as they negotiate a business saving loan. The bank agreed to do the loan, but only under the condition of layoffs. And so the first round of TSR purchase began. Meanwhile, in Hollywood, Gygax was still trying to turn the success of the D&D cartoon into interest in his movie. Eventually, Gygax got veteran writer James Goldman to pin a second screenplay. But not everyone in the company was hemorrhaging money. Rose Estes had been hired on as the 13th employee for TSR. She was a writer since childhood and had a brilliant and imaginative mind. Rose never cared much for D&D. The raucous atmosphere of the men at TSR and their incessant bickering over modifiers completely turned her off from the game, but she was damn good at her job. She spent a lot of time writing about how the game was played. She did newspaper and television interviews on behalf of TSR, explaining that the game was not satanic or evil. She was a one-woman crisis team for TSR for a game she didn't even play in the midst of the satanic panic. She took some time off to follow a circus around and write articles about it. During this time, while waiting in a lobby, she found a choose-your-own-adventure novel for sale. Instantly, she realized that the choose-your-own-adventure story genre was perfect for explaining D&D to new people. She fought with upper management for weeks before they finally told her, If you want to do it, go write it yourself. Infuriated by this dismissal of herself and her idea, she did just that. In a moment, she had turned TSR into a publisher. And then she wrote six more, and then she spent the next decade writing the best-selling Endless Quest novel series for TSR under their publishing division, growing it into a profitable and reliable arm of the business. In 1995, in a car accident, she suffered a severe head injury. This head injury brought on aphasia. She completely lost the ability to write. That's just how life goes sometimes. Even when women beat all the odds, they can hit some random hurdle that destroys everything they've built. Except, it didn't. Rose Estes then went on to become a professional photographer of dogs, and in her photography journey, she came across a photograph of the first dogs of their breed. Motivated and inspired, she forced herself to write a history of the dog breed, slowly regaining the ability to write over the course of a year. She has now released three different histories of dog breeds in America and is still writing to this day. God, she rules. During her tenure at TSR, she introduced Jean Black, a Lake Geneva native, to TSR. Jean Black was a managing editor prior to working at TSR. She was originally brought in to oversee efforts to expand into making educational modules for the classroom, but that was quickly scrapped and she instead was put in charge of the newly formed books department. There, she tapped Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman for the task of writing a novel based on their successful Dragonlance adventure modules. I could do an entire episode on these two, so just know that this is only the high-level overview. The Dragonlance universe was created by husband and wife wonder team Laura and Tracy Hickman. Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman were both employees of TSR. An author was hired to help write Dragonlance, but Tracy Hickman and Margaret Weiss were both heavily invested in the project. They found this author lacked the understanding of the characters that they had developed over months of work and ultimately took the reins of the project themselves. These novels would go on to become a massive success for TSR, and Dragonlance would become one of the most beloved settings in Dungeons and Dragons. When Jean Black passed away in 2014, Tracy Hickman wrote, Jean was the first Weiss and Hickman fan. She was the one who championed us to write the novels when no one else thought we could do it. She stood up for us and went to bat with TSR Brass to make sure we were the ones who wrote the novels. Without her, none of what followed would have happened. Dragonlance was a smash success, quickly selling out its 30,000 print run and demanding a second printing. TSR immediately expanded the book order to a trilogy. Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman were dual threats, able to write engaging novels and then convert them into exciting adventure modules. They would continue to revisit Dragonlance at every opportunity over the years, continuing to delight their fans even today with one of D&D's longest running and most beloved settings. And of course, who would D&D tap to create the iconic illustration for this setting? Larry Elmore. Uh, a fun little side story that's not in the script here, but 
when Weiss and Hickman went uh, got their first book deal in New York away from TSR, mm-hmm. uh, Elmore asked if he could be in on their deal, like if he could do their covers. Mm-hmm. Um, they were like, well, gosh, this is a big New York publisher, Elmore. We don't know if they're going to, you know, if they're going to hire you. Um, so they went in and talked to the publishers. They were having this conversation about the book and everything else. And finally, you know, they just sort of nervously say, hey, um, we'd you really appreciate if uh, Elmore could illustrate our, our cover. And the book publisher was like, oh, God, we were going to ask you if you could get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he ended up following them even after That's they great. left TSR. That's great. Mm-hmm. Okay, enough stalling. Back to the managerial drama. I know that's what you're all here for. Kevin Bloom held on to the games division of TSR. He went through wave after wave of purges, shutting down staff from 312 to less than 105 successive waves of layoffs, often 40 people at a time. TSR's creditors demand the addition of three outside members to be added to the board of directors. These individuals had been characterized as cronies of the Blooms, but that's not really fair. These guys were sent here by the banks. They weren't anyone's friends but the banks. Kevin removed himself from executive duties and handed the reins of TSR over to Richard Konings, one of the bank-appointed executives. For the first time, the company was truly in the hands of someone with no connection to gaming at all. Two agonizing years passed for TSR as Gary tried in vain to get his movie project off the ground. Talent was shed violently. Gary Gygax finally returned from Hollywood as things at TSR came to a head. He exercised his stock option for 700 shares and used his newfound slim majority to wrest control of his company back. With a narrow 51% between himself and his son, he called a vote and had Kevin Bloom removed as CEO. But he didn't really need that slim majority. The bank investors had sided with him. They agreed that Kevin had to go. Okay, so here's my final word on Kevin Bloom. Kevin Bloom was a regular guy from Lake Geneva. He had more business knowledge than Brian or Gary, but he was not prepared to run a $30 million company. The Blooms are often accused of bringing in the other three board members to strong arm Gary out of control. But then why would those same board members vote with Gary to remove Kevin? The simple fact is all three of these people were woefully ill prepared to run a company of this size. They made a mistake in acquiring SPI and Greenfield Needlewomen, but SPI was a Gary choice, and Gary spent three years blowing cash on Hollywood to accomplish jack and shit, renting a mansion. I'm not ready to sit here and say Kevin was any worse for TSR than anyone else was. None of these people could have done this job, but that does not excuse the abysmal treatment of employees at this time. Brutal low wages, long hours in a hostile work environment, a complete lack of support for the people in the workplace, total disrespect to the women who worked for them, and completely stripping artists of their ownership over their own work. None of these guys did a good job. But even for guys doing a bad job, these guys did a bad job. No one gets a pass here. I'm glad Kevin is leaving, but I don't see this as Gary triumphing over a villain. A cleanse has begun and it will rip through the entirety of this company and eventually destroy it. But maybe TSR needed to die. Jeez. I wasn't expecting that at the end. (laughs) Is that how it's usually, like, I guess, portrayed? Uh Uh-huh. Uh, that Kevin, that Gary went off and wasn't aware of things, and Kevin and Brian got all greedy and ran the company mm-hmm. into the ground, and then Gary comes back and heroically saves the day, only to then be betrayed himself. But we'll get to that eventually. But yeah, that's generally how it's betrayed, and I don't buy a word of it. All mm-hmm. three of these guys, I mean, they just weren't CEOs. They just weren't businessmen. Yeah. Now this is this is a name and a half. I think you're going to have to explain this. <laughs> okay, wait. Originally, mm-hmm, it was mm-hmm. Becky Me. Like uh-huh. like a me character on the Wii. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then it kind of... it, it I, I hid that away because I didn't want you to know the name that I had planned. And you had written um, Chaotic uh, yeah, on the Yeah, I wrote alignment. on the alignment. Yeah, because yeah. I was like, well, you know, my God, it tells me to write my alignment down. So I guess <laughs> I should do that. I was trying to be a good little D and D player uh-huh. uh, and take note of that for my character. <laughs> and so then you revealed Becky Me. 
and then chaotic. It became chaotic. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? This character is chaotic. Sure, mm-hmm. that'll be their name, but they can't spell it. Uh, so I, I had to I had to so mess around with the letters. This edition is a bit interesting because it is just a revision of a previous edition, right? It's yes. like it's not really a true, completely new edition of the game. So uh, it's a little bit... In, I, I was kind of curious coming into this, like, how it would go, how you'd feel about it. Like, would it even feel different? Would it just be a rehash of last week? It um, didn't yeah. feel that different. Mm-hmm. Of course, yeah. Because yeah. so much of it is similar, yeah. Yeah, and I, you know what? The the Because the biggest thing for me about Basic was that, you know... Dwarfs are a class. Elves are a class, mm-hmm. you know, um, and they've, they've got their their own stuff going on. Um, and that was the same here. So that biggest thing still being the same, which makes sense because this is just like an, an expansion upon basic, I guess. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that that, that, that makes sense. Uh, um, yeah, but uh, so but it still was quite a different character building experience uh, yes. in the end. Not because the rules had changed. The rules were all still the same. For the most part, yeah. But the layout of the book was quite different. Oh, that was frustrating for me, actually. Now, mm-hmm. the book is fun. And actually, I one thing that I thought was really interesting from your book report, mm-hmm. uh, the mentioning of Rose with the uh, the Choose Your Own Adventure novels, mm-hmm. is because at the towards the beginning of that book, we had almost a... Um, like a laid out adventure with with the endings written out like a choose your own adventure. Like if your yeah. character fails the save, if you succeed the save. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, yeah, we had noticed that while writing that. So the fact that um, I guess that became the, the choose your own adventures was like a part of that era, I guess we'll say, right, mm-hmm. is, is interesting. And I wonder then if that had influence on like how that was written out. Because even in basic, it didn't have like that whole scenario did basic have a scenario? yeah I, the, so the thing that they do when you open the yeah. book is they walk you through the character sheet that's been filled out for you yes. and then they walk you through an adventure uh that's sort of been played for you uh and all of this is sort of a, a tutorial for the game and that's brand new that's not in the old one the old one had a adventure in it but it wasn't pre-written out for you yeah. like that um and i i do think like I like the spirit of the change. I don't necessarily know that I like the layout of the change. It's the lack of like breaking things up and and, yeah. and, and the layout issues that we had later. It's um, a bit newspaper like in a way. Break that stuff out too. Like just put all the game stuff over here and put the lore over here and that'll be fine. Yeah, admittedly I had a hard time, even though it was in its own like section, I mm-hmm. maybe with how it was broken up, I had a hard time finding the prerequisite for each class. Despite mm-hmm. it was you know, it had a little bolded thing that said prime requisite, right? Yeah. Um but I still had trouble finding it for well, most I, of them I, and I didn't realize until after the fact. I think part of that is because the classes are not laid out in an orderly fashion. Like, they okay. interrupt the, cl- the... Like, right after Cleric, they put the Cleric spells. And yes. I think, like, not breaking that out into its own section is a mistake. Because mm-hmm. having to scroll through something that's not classes for a long time just kind of disturbs the the sort of... Yeah. Rhythm, like, where it's like, I want to look through the classes. I don't want to then get into the nitty-gritty of the class spell list. Yeah, because when you're when you're trying to determine, you know, mm-hmm. granted, there's a lot more requirements for this is your... You, you need a minimum spat, stat of this to be this. There's still a little bit of that sure. here. Um, but, like, when you're thumbing through to try to figure out, okay, here's what I rolled with my 3d6. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what are my options... Yeah. scrolling through like three five pages of spells is not what i want to see there are also no less than three different places in the book where they walk you through character creation uh yeah. and they're all handled differently like the first time it's all pre-written out the stats are all done for you the second yeah. time it's like a super dense chart that just like gives you six steps in order like bam 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 bam, bam. and then the third time it's like link, uh, lengthy paragraphs about choosing your abilities and stuff like that and it's just not like the charts are in different places through all these three different times. And uh, there's just something about it that doesn't quite hit. Yeah, something about the way it's organized just doesn't. Yeah, it just doesn't ever. It's not as smooth as basic was in that way. 
with the because we're still in the we're still in the mode of uh, the sp different species you could play as are the classes themselves, mm -hmm. right? So human is divided into cleric. I'm still gonna say fighting men because it's mm -hmm. so it's so funny to me. Yeah, uh, it, you know, cleric fighter. But then it interrupts that with those character sheets. And again, mm -hmm. probably because we said okay, that's in the middle of the bucket. It's like easier to tear out, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're looking like i had scrolled past that because i was trying to peruse what can i do with these stats that we maybe haven't done before because you know yeah. trying we just did dwarf and dwarfs are kind of fighter like yeah dwarfs are very fighter. yeah so it was like okay maybe not that but because I, I was underneath that character sheet mm -hmm. and i was trying to find cleric so i you know and granted we're scrolling 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 so Maybe it feels different also to scroll through, you know? <laughs> um, but, like, I, w I got up to that character sheet section, and I was like, oh, I missed it. Because I expected it, you know, to, you know, yeah. be in order of like, oh, this is the other section. I've scrolled too far. Cleric is somewhere under here. No, it's not. <laughs> it was yeah. above that. And it just gets interrupted by the uh, the character sheet there. I think the thing that they're struggling with is this is kind of two products merged into one. Mm -hmm. um, and nowadays we have these two products separated. There's the um, there's the sort of like starter kits that they sell that are like pre-filled out character sheets, very simple explanation of the rules, 30 page rules, 30 page adventure, uh, get people into the game. And then there's the actual rule books, right? And this is yes. kind of trying to be both a rule book for the basic system, but mm -hmm. also a starter kit to introduce people to the concepts of play. Um, and so balancing those two dynamics makes it not as good of a rule book uh, and maybe not as good as a starter kit either. Uh, it, it's kind of splitting its focus in these two different directions that are, are maybe a little bit incompatible. Yeah, I think we there was a there was a specific table. I don't remember mm -hmm. if it was in basic, but there was a specific table that said like, hey, if your stats for all stats, right, mm -hmm. this is the range of bonuses and penalties. Yeah, if your stat you know, gives a bonus or penalty, stat, yeah. it'll be this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, which is interesting. Now, now it still branches out from there, you know, because it was like, OK, uh, if it's con, well, that that might do this or that might do that. But yeah, uh, but it, it's no. at least moving towards that standardization that we yes. are kind of familiar with now. And then also there was just an easy to f the, the try for saving throws was so much easier to find because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I remember I think maybe it was AD and D. Um, we were like you you had to look at the chart and then you had to make sure that you weren't a dwarf so you didn't have any additions mm -hmm. uh, you know to some of those magic yeah, resistance we were halflings. Playing a, a halfling in AD&D. Yes, the halflings halflings had dwarf sa saving stats. That's what it was. Exactly, yeah. They wisely understood, "Hey, we're only designing for levels 1 to 3. We don't need to give them information they don't need." Um, yeah, because the different yeah. books were we. This is this is basic. This is the B. Mm -hmm. um, but the different books were the I guess the different levels. Yeah. Right? So, so expert goes from six to twelve. Um, wow, you're considered an expert at that point. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, and then the companion goes from twelve companion. to like eighteen, I think, mm -hmm. and then so on and so forth. Uh, master goes eighteen to like twenty plus, and then mm -hmm. uh, immortal goes from. 30s no. upwards i think up to 36 is the highest level mm -hmm. which feels very arbitrary but regardless <laughs> yeah uh, everything in D&D is arbitrary ultimately um so if you had one sort of main takeaway from beck me versus making characters in previous versions what would it be mm, like other than the organization stuff because honestly mm -hmm. it was just that other than that like it was really easy yeah. Uh, well, because it's still, you know, basic. Uh, yeah, though yeah. I forgot about my AC until later. We are still playing um, something that is very much yeah. in the lineage of OD&D. It sure. still has that smoothness to it once you find, you know, mm -hmm. your your class page. You know, yeah. everything for it's basically on that class page. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it was smooth. It was smooth. Yeah. Um, all right. Well. Turn Undead existed in the book. Yeah, that's right true. They, on the cleric page, the first thing you mentioned. That's actually a, an interesting thing to know. Yeah, they gave the players access to their own information, which yes. AD&D says no. <laughs> I, I saw one person who requested a, 
all the characters that you make to be put together at the end. <laughs> oh, I can do that, yeah. Uh, and I thought that that was very... Uh, I, I'm glad to see that there are people who are fans of your of your adorable little characters. <laughs> oh yeah, this one wearing the Wii Mote around his neck and the nuncha, the Wii Mote holy symbol. We got through there. the whole episode without talking about the yeah. Wii Mote <laughs> and the frying pan weapon. <laughs> um, honestly, we didn't really go that deep into your character sheet this no. time. Uh, we we di there are some great notes here about the frying pan. Can't afford the holy water. The mace is a frying pan. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't afford holy water. It's so much. so much. Wait, that's the other thing that I noticed. Yeah. Everything was expensive. The economy like, in shambles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like 25 gold for holy water felt like a lot when I only had 100 gold that I had to like buy all my stuff. And a week of rations was 15 gold. Unless I read that wrong on the table and it said like 15 silver. <laughs> but I don't think it did. I think it was 15 gold. And I was a little caught up back because like when we do rations, it's like what? Like, I don't think we gold? switched to the silver system until second hmm. edition. So Really? Yeah. Well, no, there were in... Oh, no, um, no, no, and AD&D did switch. With yeah, the yeah, because I remember my chickens, the character that had chickens, right. those costed three copper. You're right. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yes. Okay, that is it for this episode. We will uh, see you next time. Uh, have a good one. And as usual, we shall sign off with our, our traditional sign off of bye. Bye. Bye.